I think this just proves I have too many books. <laughs> hey folks, it's Abby and today I'm doing another unhaul. So you may have seen my other unhauls, I did one at the end of July and one in the middle of August. And now I'm doing another one. I've already counted these. I have 75 books in this box that are leaving my life. They're going to be going to a mixture of places, I'm going to try and sell some. All of the ones that are suitable for kids up to the age of 11 will be going to my old primary school. That's that age bracket. And the rest of them, then, if I can't sell them or give them to them, will go to charity. I, again, went through these with Caitlin from My Cheshire Rabbit. Honestly, without that woman, half of these books would not be in here. <laughs> she is just very good at making me be like, mm. It's just having someone watch over your shoulder who also knows your reading taste and it's like, mm, bitch, you're not gonna read that. <laughs> like, would you ever pick this up for me? No. Get rid of it. So, um, thank you once again, Caitlin, who has been helpful in every single one of these big book unhauls, and they wouldn't have been as big without you. In total, that is somewhere around 150, 170 books. There was 55, I can't do maths. There was 55 in the first one, 42 in the second one, and there's 75 in this one. And now it's gonna bug me. 172. 172 books in total. What the hell? Um, so yeah, and I still have quite a lot of books, like I have another one of these full in the garage. So, there's a lot of books to go through. <laughs> but yes, so I am going to try and organise these into age range, just because it'll help me when I have to then give them to the school. <laughs> and let's go through them all. Okay, so they're all now split into piles, so let's get into it. <laughs> First up, the first section is books that I'm going to try and gift, try and gift, I'm not going to force them on her, but if she'd like them, to my friend Georgia, and those are my Doctor Who books that I don't wish to keep anymore. So I have a large collection of Doctor Who books and it came about by accident, so I am letting some of them go. Me and Georgia both absolutely adore Doctor Who so so much, and so I thought that it would be worth offering these to her to see if she'd like them before I then looked at just letting them go elsewhere. So first up we have A History of the Universe in 100 Objects, which is exactly as it sounds, just mentions things, just different situations from the show and discusses them in more detail. It's really interesting and I really enjoyed reading through it. Then we have one that I'm loath to let go, The Shakespeare Notebooks. Doctor Who? That is the question. This is a load of Whovian stuff written in the style of Shakespeare's plays. It's incredibly well done, it's really interesting, I really love it, and I don't want to get rid of it. But Caitlin was like, are you going to reread it? And I was like, mm, no. So, I'm going to offer it to Georgia and hope she takes it. <laughs> and then finally, just realised I didn't say the authors for these. Does it say anywhere? No. Okay, so the authors for the Shakespeare one are James Goss, Jonathan Morris, Julian Richards, Justin Richards, and Matthew Sweet. And for this one it is James Goss and Steve Tribe. And then the last Doctor Who book that is going is Eleven Doctors, Eleven Stories by Owen Colfer, Michael Scott, Marcus Sedgwick, Philip Reeve, Patrick Ness, Rochelle Mead, Mallory Blackman, Alex Scarrow, Charlie Hickson, Derek Landy, and Neil Gaiman. I really enjoyed this, I ended up getting it secondhand in Barter Books um, and I couldn't resist when I saw it and I've given some of these short stories five stars, like I really really enjoyed them but I won't read it again and I think that this may be something that she would enjoy. Um, she's not as big of a reader as me, uh, she's more on the normal end of reading like occasionally she'll read a book and so with these being short stories and about Doctor Who I think she might enjoy them. And those are the Doctor Who books done. Then the next section I'm going to go through is adult fiction. So first up we have two more Agatha Christie books. In the second unhaul I got rid of quite a lot of these. I didn't realise that these were out in the garage so they're also going to which is The Clocks and Five Little Pigs. Agatha Christie, Poirot books. I really like them. I give all of Agatha Christie's books three or four stars. So I did really enjoy them but I'm not going to read them again so they are being let go. Sticking on a thriller theme we have The Girl on the Train by Paula Hawkins. I just found this fine. Just fine. I don't intend to read it again, so 
it can go. And then The Teacher by Katarina Diamond. I adored this. Like, this was fantastic. I'm getting rid of it because I won't read it again. However, it's the first book in a thriller series and I, I want to pick up the rest of them, um, possibly on ebook. I want to have a look into it, but this is so well done, so dark. When I then described this to Caitlin, she's now put it on her TBR. When have you ever seen Caitlin read a thriller? Th this is really good, really good. Like, I genuinely really, really recommend it, but I won't reread it. So it's going to go to another home where someone else can get the enjoyment out of it. Then moving on to historical based books, the first one is the only non-fiction and that is My War Is Not Over by Harry Schindler and Marco Petrucci, I think. This is Marco Petrucci's life, it's a memoir written by Harry Schindler who interviewed Marco um, and had the discussions with him about World War II, the Second World War in Italy. It's very very interesting. It was a really, really interesting read. I got this. I got this when Goodreads used to let the giveaways also be in the UK. They had UK giveaways. They no longer do that. They're now US only. Rude. But I got this then. I read it. I really enjoyed it. I really appreciated it. I won't pick it up again. Sticking with World War II, we have The Information Officer by Mark Mills. This is set in Malta. It doesn't involve too much of the war. It's more of the interpersonal relationships mixed in with the setting of being at war but there isn't too much fighting, so slightly different to normal, like it's not, you know, in the action, but it's very, very interesting. And I did really enjoy it. I think I gave it four stars at the time, but it's not one I'm going to reread. The Secret Scripture by Sebastian Barry. This is about a woman who is in a mental hospital and this patient, this woman, her records have been lost. So no one actually knows why she's in the hospital and she's just kept there and the doctor as the hospital's closing down with this 100 year old woman or at least she's coming up on 100 year old nearing her 100th birthday he learns more about why she's there and what happened with her life in rural 1930s Ireland and with her husband and how she ended up in the mental hospital this if you have any knowledge about 1930s Ireland or just Ireland previously then you can kind of guess why she's in there. Um, it plays upon those themes, um, but it's very, very interesting. And I, I really, really enjoyed this, but I won't reread it. This is another one where it's now added on Caitlin's TBR. <laughs> Genuinely, this is a fantastic book and it's one of the ones that got me back into reading again when I started uni. Okay, the final, I think, historical fiction is The Revenant by Michael Punk. This is the book that inspired the movie with Leonardo DiCaprio. My dad's seen the movie, apparently it's good. This is a man who is traversing across the United States in 1832. 1823, why did I swap those around? Uh, <laughs> I do that all the time with numbers. But in 1823, he's traversing the wilderness of the United States for some reason, I can't remember. And he is attacked by a bear and his companions leave him for dead. But he ain't dead. And it's him like trying to survive. This was really good, it's really intense, I really enjoyed it and I'm glad I read it, but I won't reread it again. The only fantastical book on the adult list is All That She Can See by Carrie Hope Fletcher. So this is a book where this young woman can bake emotions into her goods and when people eat them, like if she bakes happiness into them, then sad people can become happy by eating them. And she is quite content in her small town just doing this and really like helping people around her and then she decides to move on. She's helped people as much as she can, she goes to another village and that's where it all goes downhill for her. That is also where the story goes downhill for me. I mentioned this in my original wrap up when I read it. Carrie Hope Fletcher tries to fit in a like big fantastical twist in the end 50 pages of this book and it just needed more fleshing out or needed to be not included in the way that it was. She goes from being this very light, fluffy fantasy that has like regular world with interspersions of little bits of fantasy in it. And then she goes full on fantasy, like people locked up in a medical institution to try and experiment on them for this magic that they have fantasy. And it, it, it isn't done well, which is annoying because this book is gorgeous. It has like tarot cards and sprayed edges and it's stunning and the beginning heart, if this had just stayed like a cute little fluffy fantasy, 
I probably would have kept this as like a really lovely book even though that isn't something that I tend to dive into but the ending in attempting to be something more than it was ruined it. Then we have two books by Lana Grace Reaver, one is fiction and one is non-fiction. Happier Thinking is the non-fiction and The Existence of Amy is the fiction. These are both really focused around mental health and I was given these both by the author for an honest review. This one gives ideas of how you can change how you think in regards to mental health and in regards to depression and anxiety. I will say that the ideas aren't exactly new but they're presented in a way that can be really helpful for someone who has depression to think about and to then action into their lives. So good book, just won't reread it. And then the existence of Amy is actually following a young woman who has OCD and then some other, I think she's got like depression and anxiety mixed in with the OCD. This was such good representation. Such good representation. So I have very, 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 very mild OCD myself. Like actual OCD, not things need to be neat, as in like... Mm, mm. Uh, and as well as depression and anxiety. And this covers it so well. I really enjoyed how it represented it and it's one of the few mental health books that didn't send me down a spiral. So usually if I read something that is deeply focused on mental health, even if it's trying to make you feel good, like Reasons to Stay Alive by Matt Haig, that screwed with my head and I was depressed for weeks after. This didn't. This was really well done, for me at least. I really liked how it was done. I think it's really just something that more people should read, but I won't reread it. So I'm going to gift this on to other people. It's self-published, if you couldn't tell by kind of the, the cover style. So this then means that more people will actually be able to read this than usual, because you wouldn't see it in a bookshop. So hopefully someone else will enjoy this. Then we have two poetry books. The first is Who is Mary Sue by Sophie Collins. And then we have Sunshine by Melissa Lee Horton. I picked these up in a charity shop because I wanted to read more poetry and these were the only poetry books in the charity shop. They were fine, but I wouldn't reread them again. And I don't think that this is quite, they're not the same and I don't want to describe it because I'm not good with poetry, but they're not quite the poetry for me. I really loved Caroline Duffy. Um, I've only read her Feminine Gospels, so I want to get more of Caroline Duffy rather than these guys. And again, someone else can enjoy them. And then the final book in the adult category is Where's Stig Glove Box Edition. <laughs> where's Wally, or if you're American, Where's Waldo? is a well-known and beloved series and this is basically, um, I now have to explain the stig for the audience. Um, so car show, evaluating cars, both race cars, race cars, both like faster cars and also just like standard everyday anyone would drive them cars and they would have this guy test drive them, he's a race car driver, all in white, you never see his face and it was like a whole thing like who's the stig and you try and find him in here, like where's Ollie? I really liked Top Gear, I don't know why. God knows why, because you wouldn't, like, I'm not a car person, but I really enjoy Top Gear. And this was actually a gherkin present, <laughs> which is basically, um, it's, in certain parts of Germany, it's a tradition to hide a gherkin or a pickle in the Christmas tree, and the kids have to find it, and whoever finds it gets a present. I am an only child, <laughs> so basically I had to find the gherkin, and this was, like, the little present for finding the gherkin, was this. <laughs> okay, that is all of the adult books. I'm then going to go into YA and then we'll go into the kids books, so hmm, the YA is the biggest pile. Let's move these adult books out of the way. Okay, so for the YA books I'm going to start with the one that really doesn't match the others and that is the audiobook of New Moon. My mum got me this, this is like CDs, like actual discs, um, and I, New Moon was my least favourite, even at the time. I hated New Moon. I think I read it twice. I read all the others like more than 10 times. I don't think I ever listened to this. I don't think I ever used this. And so whilst it kind of breaks my heart a bit that my mum spent so much money because audiobooks aren't cheap. It only has the American prices on here, but it's showing as 54 US dollars. 70 Canadian dollars. And I never used it. So it's going to go to a better home. I'm really sorry mum. <laughs> Okay, now, onto the standard YA. These are not going to be split up into genre because simply I cannot be asked. First up, we have The Future of Us by Jay Asher and Karen Mackler. This is a YA contemporary with a fantastical twist. It's set uh, a while ago. <laughs> ah! um, it's set in 1996 
which is the year I was born, and Josh's family gets a free AOL CD in the mail. I now have to explain this. Basically, when the internet first came about, you'd send out a CD to install the software to be able to access it, um, and AOL was... I don't know what we used in the UK, for some reason I only know the US version of this, but yeah, um, AOL is what they used in the US. You put it in... I got this when I was in America, I think. What did I? Or did I? No, no, this is UK, but it's an American book. And so they put this AOL CD into the computer, and they find their Facebook profiles even though Facebook isn't invented for another eight years, and it lets them see into their future. This is a lot of fun, like genuinely it's a lot of fun, but I won't reread it. Lock and Key by Sarah Dessen, I can't even remember what this is about. Um, abandoned by her mother and forced to leave the house she calls home, she's facing too many changes. Uh, gorgeous Boy Next Door, standard YA contemporary, I think I enjoyed it at the time, but not something I'm going to reread again. The Fault in Our Stars by John Green, I read this on an ebook and then bought this book and I've never read this physical copy and I won't read it again. Bye. Are you knocking? Yep. <laughs> what do you need? Well, a room. Do you need it in here? Uh, I can put it in there. What, the error? Yeah. You're gonna have to... Oh, the battery needs charged on this, so I could charge the battery, but then it'll still have to be moved in the end. Uh, I will move all the books into my room and film in there. Yes, the camera was still on. <laughs> Do you want to say hi to the camera? Just so that you know, but... Oh, He was swearing at you, I wanted to show you. So I've moved. <laughs> I was filming the potato. I was filming in the spare room, and um, we needed to put the washing in there because it's drizzling outside. So I had to move into my bedroom. So I moved all the hooks and I charged my camera for a bit. Where was I? <laughs> because as well, I've moved. I have then been able to slash thought I made it well while I waited for the battery to charge. Organize the books slightly. So now the YA books are a little more organized. So we have. 13 Little Blue Envelopes by Maureen Johnson. I got this when I was in New York many moons ago. This is a YA contemporary, which is so... look at how floppy! I enjoyed this. Um, it's nice, there's like these little um, envelopes from a... who is it? Who is it? Who is it? Mum? Grandmother? I think it's grandmother, if I remember. Um, left envelopes with some money inside and telling the main character, Ginny, to follow these instructions and like go and fly around the world. I think she goes from the US to Europe um, and things like that. And it's really interesting. I really liked how it went, but it's a standard YA contemporary. Not my sort of thing now. Now this is a standard UK paperback. <laughs> This is Dash and Lily's Book of Dares by Rachel Cohen and David Leatherton. Ironically, this is American authors, but it's printed in the UK. Um, and this is someone who leaves a red notebook with some dares in it in her favourite bookshop. And she's hoping that someone's going to pick it up and that she can like make a friendship or a relationship with this person. Um, and so Dash picks it up and they start out rocky, they start out not getting on, but as things progress they end up understanding each other more. This is again another standard YA contemporary. This is set in Christmas time, I believe. Yes, it's set in Christmas time, so it's a nice little Christmas read, but I won't read it again. Then we have Girl Online by Zoe Sugg, kind of. I recently got rid of Girl Online on tour and Girl Online going solo. I had tried to read them many. Oh, this is a well bookmark. And the and the receipt. <laughs> It cost my mum fifteen pound fifteen. No, it did not. It cost my mum five pounds and nineteen pence because she got the staff discount as well as it being on half price offer. So it's meant to be thirteen pounds, and she got it for a fiver. So not bad. So I recently got rid of the second two in the series. I haven't read them. This is another standard way contemporary. I read it. I enjoyed it. However, they're quite big books to take up quite a lot of space on my shelves for a genre that I won't ever touch again and also 
they're fine like it's, it's written well like it's an enjoyable average YA contemporary but it's nothing special and also it's not even written by Zoe Sugg and I don't even like Zoe Sugg mum bless her heart was like oh Abby watches a lot of YouTube this is by a, a British YouTuber and it's a book and she likes books I'll get her it I've never been someone to watch Zoe Sugg I tried to watch some of her videos once my mum got me this and she's fine she's just an okay creator but not my sort of vibe so this is gonna go to a better home where someone is going to be a lot more excited to own the book then we have Just In Case by Meg Rosoff so actually Olivia from Olivia's Catastrophe recently got rid of this one um, and I was like oh yeah I've got that it's absolutely gorgeous it has this beautiful kind of ready pink um, writing under the dust jacket which I love and these bright orange end pages which contrast really nicely with the green of the dust jacket this is basically about a young boy, a young boy, a young man, who ends up running away from home and he changes his name. So his name's David and he changes his name to Justin, as in just in case. His name's David Case. And it's kind of about what happens when he runs away from home um, and the different points in his life. And it's a very interesting book. I really enjoyed it. It's one of the YA contemporaries that I've liked more. It's a bit darker, a bit more like coming of age rather than just like a romance. Um, so it is a very good book and I genuinely, if that is your sort of genre, I do recommend it but it's not something I would read again and it's not something that was so impactful for me that I would want to retain it on my shelves despite it not being something that I would usually have. It's not one of the ones that I'm like, yes this was amazing. Really liked it, I think I might have given it four stars but not enough to say. Then we have Vanished by Meg Cabot, writing as Jenny Carroll. This is a bind up of When Lightning Strikes and codename Cassandra for the Vanished series. This is a really cool YA series. It's about this, oh that's my camera lens. Yeah. It's about a young girl called Jessica Mastriani, never said that out loud before, um, who's caught in a thunderstorm and by the end of it she can now find missing people, dead or alive. She can like just sense where they are and find them and so it kind of goes from there kind of the fact that she can do this, how this gets us into trouble um, it's a darker YA, definitely. It's not a light one. This was really good. I really liked it. This is the sort of one where if it slightly grabbed me more, it could have stayed because it is contemporary with a fantastical twist. I really do recommend picking this up if you are in the YA age bracket. I am not, so it is going. It's very hard for me to keep YA books on my shelves that aren't like something that really, really I really adored at the time, or now, if I'm reading it now. Um, so yeah, this one's going. But I recommend it, it's a very good book. Speaking of very good books, I have Holes and Small Steps by Louise Sakar. Sacha? Sakar? I'm gonna go with Sakar. Um, I didn't read these until I was an adult. I think I read these in 2019-ish. Um, Holes is much better than Small Steps. I gave Small Steps three stars, I think I gave Holes four or five stars. I really did enjoy it, I think it's really clever. This book, <laughs> this is the sequel. This one is about a young boy who's sent off to kind of like a youth correctional facility sort of thing and they are in the middle of the desert and they're forced to just dig holes in the ground and it's like a really abusive environment and it's about how the boys survive this. There's a deeper story to the holes being dug in the ground, it's not just manual labour for the sake of manual labour, there's something deeper going on. I did really really like this, I think it's an amazing book. This then follows on from that and kind of takes the story and runs a bit more with the like what's in the holes rather than um, the boys in the camp themselves. Very interesting geology. Um, I would recommend reading it and giving it a shot. Again, especially if you're in the age bracket, if you're actually in the YA age bracket, I think this will be a lot more impactful for you. I recommend. And then for a historical fiction, I think it's the only historical fiction I have. Yes. And then everything else is delving into... I say delving into the fantastical. Those were already fantastical but we're going to delve into the fantasy in a moment. In a moment. Um, but yes, so we have Rose Under Fire by Elizabeth Fine. I picked this up because I got codenamed Verity when I was out in the US by the same author and this is another book set in World War II. I really did like this. Um, this is about a young US pilot called Rose who isn't allowed to fly in the US military in World War II because she's a woman so she goes to the UK and flies with our pilots instead. Um, doing kind of reconnaissance and flying spies over to France and things like that and 
obviously it's World War II and fiction, not everything goes right and it's about this story and how that evolves. It is really good, I really really interested, really really interested in it, I really really enjoyed it and found it interesting, but I won't pick it up again. I'm more likely to pick up Codename Verity again, which I've kept. So this one is going to go to A Better Home. Now for the, the lightest of the fantasies, and then we go into fantasy, and then we have some non-fiction at the end. <laughs> So, the lightest of the fantasies is the Airhead Trilogy by Meg Cabot. This is another one that I'm pretty sure Olivia Savannah got rid of recently. Um, <laughs> these I didn't read until recently, I'd actually owned for years. I got them in America, um, they're signed copies. I bought them from the Scholastic shop in New York, so I must have been 16, so this would have been about 2013 that I bought them, uh, maybe 2012, um, and I didn't read them until like 2020 why. Um, I would have loved these if I'd read them at the time, it's such a pity. These basically follow a young, they follow two young girls essentially, but we're in the point of view of one young girl. Young girl? It's YA, they're teenagers. I'm only 24, why am I acting as if I'm like 82? So it follows this teenage girl who doesn't care about fashion and about being pretty and all that, and after her and a girl who does care about this are hit on the head, they somehow change, like exchange consciousnesses, and she is now in the body of this model. Same age as her, teenager, but she's in the body of this like really well-known model, and it's trying to adapt to this life that this model has, which isn't as perfect as it seems from the outside, obviously, and also kind of the sci-fi elements, I suppose, of the fact that they've changed brains, and also then, where is she? So her body is like in a coma, um, and she's then in the model's body, but obviously the model is in her head in the coma. So then it, it delves into this across the, the books. I think it's really well done um, in certain points about the kind of the concept of celebrity not being up to scratch um, and not everything as it seems and the difficulties that different lives can have. They are a little bit of their time. The first book was published in 2008 and so there are the standard issues that you kind of expect from YA contemporaries, I'm aware this is kind of sci-fi, but YA contemporaries at the time, um, they're definitely present within the books, so that is obviously a pity, um, and part of me does want to keep these because they are signed and I got them in the US, um, so yeah, part of me is like, oh you should keep them for that, I tabbed this one up, I didn't write in it I don't think, oh no, did I? I've just had to remove that because that's a spoiler. Uh, <laughs> So I did tab up and make notes in this one. I enjoyed them. They were fun. The thing is I won't reread them. Like, you, you can tell I want to keep them, but I won't reread them, so they need to go. Which is sad. But they'll go to a better home. Ooh, I annotated this. Okay, so this is Aru by David Meredith. This was sent to me by the author for an unbiased review. It's self-published, and I enjoyed it. But not enough for me to keep it and not enough for me to read the sequel, which I've already unhauled, I think, in the first of my three unhauls. We follow the sister of um, a girl whose body is wasting away and she, I don't know exactly what illness it is, but she has some sort of chronic illness, she's going to die soon, and so her consciousness is uploaded into a digital format, into kind of like a digital video game world. Um, and. So they, they at first think that that's an amazing thing, they get to kind of keep her around, but it discusses the concept of accepting death and not accepting death, it discusses the concept of having a consciousness uploaded and having full control over someone in that aspect, like the company who does this has complete control over her because they have her consciousness in code. Um, and then the main character, the sister, is able to go and visit the girl in this world and kind of she can see... Um, from the outside perspective of the bad things that are going on, whereas the girl in the world obviously is controlled and exposed to less, so she can't see everything, and it is very very interesting. There are some quite um, deep, I've made notes in here, like querying basically, there's some some pedophilic notes, so th this one definitely needs content warnings, 100%, <sighs> I always hate doing this, for all of these, all of <laughs> for all of these books, for all of these unholes, there are trigger warnings in the description. I say I hate doing it because it takes seven million years because there's so many books. I don't even know if the trigger warnings 
for all of these 75 books will fit in the description because I had to shrink them down for the 42 book on haul because they didn't fit. So I don't know if they will. If they don't fit in the description then I will leave linked like some sort of like Google Doc or something with all of them in there just so that they are available. They are always available. I always put the trigger warnings in the description. I put them in the description because some people consider them to be spoilers so I don't want to spoil someone but also I want them to be easily accessible. So they will be in the description in some format whether directly there or in a link that you can go check out. But yes, this was good. I enjoyed it. I think I gave it four stars. The beginning was very very slow, the end I very much enjoyed and I will never read it again. Scarlet by Marissa Mayer. I got rid of Cinder, the first book in the Lunar Chronicles in the other unhaul, the first unhaul. <laughs> so this one kind of had to go. I like the series. I enjoy both Scarlet and Cinder. They have their problems but I will be continuing with the series but I think I'm going to do it like from the library or by ebooks or something, I don't need to retain this series. It's one I'm enjoying reading, but in like a weird, um... I've seen J.D. Ray Reads talk about Holly Black's books as like fast food, in that they're junk, you know they're junk, but you still enjoy them for that point in time. That's what this is for me. They're not works of literature, they're not really in-depth fantasy worlds, there are problems with them, they are problematic in certain aspects, however I enjoy them and I would like to finish the series but I don't need to own them so these are going. Kind of similarly is Melinda Salisbury's or Salisbury's The Sin Eater's Daughter. I enjoyed this. Uh, this is the first book in the series, this girl who kills with a single touch. She's kind of kept away from people um, and kept by the royalty as this kind of pet slash weapon and it is the development of that story and learning, her learning more about her world and her place in the world. I enjoyed it. There are more books in the series. I don't think I'm going to read them. I was fine with this as it was. It does leave on like a bit of a, a cliffhanger sort of thing, um, but I am done with this series, so someone else can enjoy it. And then we have another book that I bought in the US. So that is The Princess and the Snowbird by Met or Mette Evie Harrison. Met Evie Harrison is what I'm going to go with. This is absolutely beautiful. Absolutely stunning. It's a gorgeous story. So she is the headstrong daughter of the hound and the bear, heir to all her royal parents magic and able to transform into at will into any animal she wishes. He is an outcast, a boy without magic, determined to make his way into the forest beholden to no one. Though Lever and Jens are as different as night and day, from the time their paths first crossed they are irresistibly drawn to one another. Each wrestles with demons. Leva with the responsibility that comes with the vast ma magic she's inherited, Jens with the haunting memories he's left behind. Separately they keep a lookout for each other and for the immense snowbird whose appearances signify a dark event on the horizon. When a terrible threat surfaces, Leva and Jens set out in an attempt to protect all they hold dear, much is at stake, for while their failure could spend, spell an end to the, all their magic, their success could bring them together at last. This is a beautiful fairy tale-esque story that is absolutely stunning and you can see that I'm now talking myself into keeping it but the thing is I don't know if I will ever reread this like it's absolutely stunning absolutely gorgeous um it does have romance in it of course if you couldn't tell from that blurb um it's definitely romanticical that's not a word but the storytelling aspect is absolutely gorgeous. I am talking myself into keeping this. God damn it. God damn it. It's absolutely stunning. This is the problem. Like, the book is absolutely gorgeous. It's so... Oh, god damn it. Okay, so I'm just start reading this. I think I have to keep it. Shit. 74 books. This isn't one that I discussed with Caitlin, and I think if I had discussed it at the time, I would have ended up just keeping it and knowing that I was going to keep it because it's really beautiful. So yeah, this is staying. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> at least it's small. Like, it's tall, but at least it's thin. So, could be worse. Okay, <laughs> I've literally just been sat reading for god knows how long. <laughs> Back on track. Okay, so now I am getting rid of Seriously, I've been reading for ages. Uh, now I'm going to be getting rid of some series. So let's go with... It's both the smallest and the biggest. 
It's the smallest in the least number of books, but it is the biggest. And that is the Dark Artifices series. So that is Lady Midnight, Lord of Shadows, and Queen of Air and Darkness. These are secondhand copies. Two of them have sprayed edges. Um, I got them all, I think, from the British Art Foundation at different points in time. In the first unhaul, I got rid of the first three books in the Mortal Instruments series. Then in the second unhaul, I got rid of the second three books. And also the first two books in the Infernal Devices trilogy. The first book is also going to be going. However, at the moment, I am filming this in August still. That's how recently these unhauls have happened, close to each other. Um, I want to read that in my August TBR. So that's staying and then we'll be unhauled once I've read it. These, I have heard that they get better that her books are a lot better in the later editions. However, I would want to read the entire overarching like world to read them, and I don't care enough, to be quite honest with you. So someone else will be super excited to get these. These are three big books. Like, not only are they, let's just pick up the third one. Not only are they big, like, let me grab, let me grab Sinia's daughter. So not only are they fat, they're also tall. So this is a lot of space that's freed up for books that I really genuinely don't care about. I picked them up because of the hype, that was it. So they are going to go, I don't even struggle to hold them. They're gonna go and someone else will be very excited to get their hands on them. So heavy. And we have the Beautiful Creatures series. So Beautiful Creatures, Beautiful Darkness, Beautiful Chaos, and then Beautiful Redemption. My mum got these for me when I was younger, um, when I was about 15. I can't hold them all. Um, they've got beautiful covers, if you look at them all. However, they are quite romance heavy. They're kind of in the Twilight-esque bracket. And I read them a little too late to be that enamoured with them. So I did enjoy them at the time. I did find them really interesting. I still think that the covers are gorgeous, but I won't ever reread them. Ever. And they don't have like an important place in my heart. Um, so they can go and someone else, again, can be very excited to grab them all and read them. Now for the final series, which again is out of order. Okay, so then we have the Maze Runner series. So we have the prequel, which is the Kill Order. We have the Maze Runner, the Scorch Trials, the Death Cure, and the Fever Code. All by James Dashner. Um, my, my last book doesn't quite match the others, but it also kind of does. I'm kind of annoyed because these look great together. They're like really nice together on a shelf. They're really bright colours. I don't have many bright colours of spines for sort of like bookstagram challenges, but that is not a reason to keep a set of books. <laughs> I enjoyed these when I read them. Um, I read them in 2016-17, maybe the last one in 2018, um, possibly, but I think 2016-2017 was when I read these. I, again, I enjoyed them, I watched the films, or at least I watched the first two films, and I liked those as well, but I don't think these would hold up on a reread, and additionally, James Dashner is a piece of shit. So, despite them being enjoyable reads, I am not going to retain them. I won't read them again. Um, yeah, if I wanted to experience the story again, I would probably just, like, watch the films. Um, because they would remind me of the books. Because, because I read, <laughs> I've said this before and I've got a feeling I'm going to get some hate for it. One, I have read the book and watched the movie. If I then get rid of the book, I can still watch the movie to get the same story as I would have got from the books. Because I remember the books. So even though it doesn't directly have the same information, it will be fine for me. So that is what I'm going to do. These are going to go. Again, some other child will probably be... I say child. They're YA. Why do I do this? Some of the teenager will be very excited to find these all in a charity shop and enjoy them. Okay, these are precarious piles. And then we have the YA non-fiction, which I didn't realise I had quite so much of, and I don't think all of it technically counts, but it's going in the category. So first up, we have Be Beautiful, Every Girl's Guide to Hair, Skin and Makeup by Alice Hart Davis and Molly Hindhow. This is by um, a mother and her daughter, and I used this quite a lot when I was younger, can't lie, can't lie. Um, it was gifted to me by my mum. It's one of those ones where it's like, oh, like, to be fair, this is really well done. It's really well done. So it talks about, like, skin issues, and not just, like, on the very, like, basic level, but also, like, 
how to genuinely deal with acne, the products that will help you. It talks about shaving and the options of both shaving and not shaving. Wow, okay. So this was published in 2009. Now, like I've said for a lot of these other books, of its time, da 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 da, this has makeup for dark skin tones. This is just a standard page and it has black skin included on this. Now, it is primarily like white skin. The author like, and the daughter are white. This is the daughter. Um, and they're using her friends, obviously with content, um, in the book. But she has friends of colour, so they are also included. They do discuss so much about different skin tones. The only reason I'm getting rid of it is because I don't need this anymore. <laughs> I'm 24. Um, whilst I'm sure some of these tips would still be great for me, I don't require them. Then we have Style by Lauren Conrad. This is all about getting like a sense of style, like how to pair things with each other. This is another one that my mum got me when I was the same sort of age. So although this can obviously be read by adults and maybe it is technically an adult book, I think it's aimed at teenagers trying to find their style. Um, my style not only does not match Lauren Conrad's, but also I think I found it now. Nice to Meet You by Jessie J. This is her memoir. I was gifted this by my mum. I loved Jessie J so, so much when I was younger. So, so much. And I think that as a young teenager, and as a teenager, she's someone who's a good role model to look up to from what I've seen so far. Um, so I really liked this when I was younger. I read through it a couple times, but I won't read it again. And then the last one is a non-fiction book which covers magical worlds. You can make assumptions from this. It's by David Corbett. I don't need to keep this anymore. Now we just have the children's middle grade books to go through. Just. Let's start with historical fiction. I have two in this category. One is Private Peaceful by Michael Mapago, and one is Anne of Green Gables by Ellen Montgomery. I read this one in 2018, I read this one as a child, I won't reread either of them ever again. I enjoyed both of them, I like both of them. This was so hard hitting and this was so much fun, so sweet, so cute, but I won't read them again, so they can go. Then to fantasy books. So we have Abigail the Breeze Fairy, which was written by Daisy Meadows, and that's one of the weather fairies in the Rainbow Magic series. I don't know if you guys have this in the US or in Canada or Australia or wherever you're watching me from, but in the UK these were really common where basically you'd, you'd get one with your name on. They have common English, British names and you would get the one with your name on as a gift. My name is Abigail. I remember not enjoying the book at the time, like it was just fine, um, but I kept it because it was my name, so this one can go now. <laughs> Then we have Midnight for Charlie Bone by Jenny Nimmo. This is a series that my mum got me. My mum bought me most of these books because they were obviously when I was younger. And it's a fantastical series where this boy can see people moving in pictures and it, he's in the normal world, which is a bit darker than our world, but it's normal. And then he's, this magic is kind of discovered by a dodgy relative of his and he's sent off to this school um, where he can kind of develop this magic. It's a really interesting series. But there was just something about it that just didn't sit quite right with me. I didn't quite love it, which is why I never continued in the series. And this cover hurts my eyes. And then lastly, we have Who Could That Be At This Hour? All The Wrong Questions by Lemony Snicket. This is a, another series that was released after the um, series of Unfortunate Events. I love the octopi on these end pages. They're so cute. Um, and there's illustrations as well, colour illustrations, whereas the full page one. Lemony Snicket, this is the same vibes as Unfortunate Events. Different story, same vibes. So I enjoyed it, but I don't think I'll continue on with the series. I'm tempted to, but I don't think I will, so this can go. But then we have <laughs> the Wind on Fire trilogy. Uh, and the reason I'm laughing is because I have two editions of it all. <laughs> so the I'll just hold up the representative ones. The Wind Singer, Slaves of the Mastery, and Fire Song. So these were both given to me by my mum. This one we found in a little charity shop in the small Scottish town that my family comes from. We found it there, we picked them up because they sounded interesting to me, and it took me years to get to them. For some reason I didn't read them until recently. Like in the past couple of years recently. I don't know why. Because the other covers are so different, 
Mum actually gifted me these a few years later, not realising that they are the same book. Like, it, next to each other it makes sense, but I can see why she didn't realise. And then I felt guilty that I hadn't read the other ones, and didn't know which ones to keep, because these all are all paperback and match, but I prefer these covers, but one of them's a hardback. So I just kept them, and then I read them, I read the secondhand ones, just to keep the the new ones in like pristine condition still, um, and I enjoyed them. I would have enjoyed them more if I'd read them as a kid, which is so frustrating, um, but I won't read them again, and they can now go off to better homes, in other words, going to my old school, <laughs> and they will enjoy them there. And then we have my large, uh, large, but large non-fiction kids book section. So first up we have I Am Malala, The Girl Who Stood Up For Education and Was Shot By The Taliban by Malala Yousafzai. This is a small part of her memoir, her autobiography. Then we have 101 Amazing Facts You Need To Know By How It Works. This isn't specifically for kids, but I think that they would get a lot out of it and it's not inappropriate for them. It's just like a standard non-fiction. So, it's like a little magazine that tells you cool things. They'll enjoy it. I have two books in the Dead Famous series. I used to have loads of these and I got rid of the rest of them. Kept these two um, because they meant more to me. And then now I'm getting rid of these as well. And all the other ones are at the school, so they'll enjoy having the rest of them. This is Winston Churchill and His Great Wars, written by Alan MacDonald and illustrated by Clive Goddard. And this is Roald Dahl and His Chocolate Factory, written by Andrew Duncan and also illustrated by Clive Goddard. These just talk about the histories of these people and their lives. It's basically biographies of them, written for children, written in a really fun manner. Last but by no means least. I didn't realise that I still had so many horrible geography books. So I mentioned these in, in the first of these unhauls, um, and I got rid of four there that were like specifically ones that I wanted, because they linked to my education and to stuff that I wanted to learn about. Um, I have a geography undergrad and a geohazards postgrad, but these are all going to go. I th so, these are all written by Anita Ganeri. Um, so apparently she's one of my most read authors. <laughs> um, illustrated by Mike Phillips and the collections of the Royal Geographical Society were used to research these. So they are accurate. And they are, they are, they are wild islands, perishing poles, intrepid explorers, odious, odious oceans, monster lakes, Cracking coasts, desperate deserts, freaky peaks, and blooming rainforests. These were so much fun. If you guys know of horrible histories, oh no, that is my puzzle. Then you will understand the the humour that's in these. It's very silly, very geared towards children, but also incredibly accurate. Um, I think these are technically more accurate than the Horrible Histories books because it's harder to be accurate with history, um, more developments come over time, we learn more, we discover that preconceptions were incorrect, whereas these are accurate as to the latest researchers when they were written, and geology, but geography, which is what these are based off of, is a very slow moving science. Um, we are still taught in schools as a fundamental stuff that happened in the 1950s. Um, that is still quite standard across the the board, so it is a slow moving science. So these should all still be quite relevant to the kids uh, and something that they can learn from. And that is it. I've done it. That is the unhaul. I'm still happy with 74. That's still a good number, so one less than whatever I mentioned before, I think it was 172. So 171, 170 is still a good number of books to be getting rid of. But yes, if you've watched all of this, what the hell? It's so long. If you want to see some more of me and see the books that I actually keep and read, please do hit the subscribe button down below and click the like button too and leave me the skull emoji because you're dead after watching this massively long video. Thanks so much for watching folks and I will see you in the next video. Bye! I have to tidy all of this up. I still have the other books from the other unhaul. I only filmed that like four days ago.